couple quick things. Is a video the best way to study for your exam? No. No, what is the best way to study for your exam? Writing. Not writing, but working problems. So the whole point of these videos is not to get you an A, it's to set you up for being able to do a bunch of practice problems. That is kind of the goal. So hopefully uh, between now and Thursday, you're doing a ton of practice problems. Um, cool. This is also gonna be a review. So I'm taking it from the standpoint that you've seen this before and that's why we are gonna move so quickly. So, and obviously you have seen this before. So let's dive in. Element versus compound, what is the difference? Yeah, hard, hard to define. Can you, let's do it this way. Can you give me an example of an element? Yeah, so, um, uh, which one would, cool, sodium. What was your favorite again? Uh, xenon. Xenon. Notice we can also have like things like diatomics. That's still an element. So there's also another form of oxygen O3, which is a triatomic, but it's still in its elemental form. We can also have something like sulfur, whose most common form is octatomic. So, and speaking of diatomics, you should know your seven diatomics. What are the seven diatomics? So it turns out they form, six out of the seven form the number seven on the periodic table. So N2, O2, F2, Cl2, Br2, I2, and then H2 is the last one. So you definitely want to know all seven of your diatomics. So you might have also heard back in high school, never have fear of ice cold beer. So that works too, but you need to know all seven. End of the day. So give me an example of a compound. Um, NaCl. Awesome. NaCl, we'll learn he's an ionic compound. There are also molecular compounds like water. So now, can you tell me what is, makes a compound different from an element? Uh, a compound is a combination of two elements. Two or more. So in this case, yes, a compound is a single substance that contains two or more elements, whereas an element is a single substance that's just a single element. Whether it's monatomic, diatomic, triatomic, or anything else is besides the point. Which brings us to pure substance versus a mixture. So pure substance versus a mixture. Any single element or any single compound is a pure substance. Whereas a mixture is more than one single substance. So I could have two elements. So say we have air. What is air mostly made up of? Well, it's actually not mostly oxygen, but that's the second highest component. What's the first highest? It's actually, actually nitrogen, yeah. There's a teeny bit of carbon dioxide in there. So, but mostly nitrogen oxygen. So it is a mixture of two different elements. That's a mixture. So we could also have like salt water, which is a mixture of salt and water. So if you combine two compounds together, so that's a mixture as well. Or you could just have an element and a compound mixed together as well. But if you have multiple elements, multiple compounds, or more than one of each, that's a mixture. Now we have two different types of mixtures. We have homogeneous and heterogeneous. Sometimes they leave that second E out, or I guess really like the fourth E in his case, but we call this just homogeneous and heterogeneous, whatever. So what is the difference? Uh, homogeneous, uh, in, in the, well, the, the prefix homo means the same. Homo means the same. Hetero means different. Hetero means different. So what is the same and what is different in these two types of mixtures? Uh, Well, they're both mixtures, but it talks about how they're mixed. And so in this case, a homogeneous mixture is one where the mixture is uniform throughout. Awesome, awesome. So a good example would be, in most cases, salt water. As long as there's not a bunch of salt sitting on the bottom. So besides that point, other than that though, salt water would be a great example of a homogeneous mixture. So heterogeneous mixture, on the other hand, think of like your vinegar oil salad dressing. So before you use your vinegar oil salad dressing, what do you have to do? Uh, mix them together. Yeah, you gotta shake it up and mix them together because it's heterogeneous. Notice, once you mix it up, it seems heterogeneous for a brief period of time, but if you just let it sit there on the table for a couple minutes, it goes and separates back out, right? So notice, if you took a sip of salt water from a glass of salt water, whether you put a straw and take a sip from the top or put the straw all the way down and take a sip from the bottom, you won't tell the difference. But if you take your vinegar oil salt, um, sorry, your vinegar oil salad dressing, if you take a sip from the top or put the straw all the way down in the bottle and put, take a sip from the bottom when it's not mixed, you will definitely taste the difference. So it is not mixed uniformly throughout. Next on the docket, chemical versus physical changes and chemical versus physical properties. 
How do I tell the difference? So chemically has changed chemically, and that's true. So basically, the result of a chemical change is that one substance has been converted into a different substance. So whether it's an element turned into a different compound, or one compound turned into a different compound, or something like that, but the substances have been changed. Whereas a physical change involves a change, but it doesn't actually change the substance itself. Exactly. So phase changes, like water to ice, would be exactly a physical change. And melting point or freezing point would be an example of a physical property. So give me an example of some chemical properties or chemical changes. Let's go chemical changes. If I take your review sheet out of your hand and crumple it up into a ball, is that chemical or physical? That's physical. That's physical. The paper is cellulose, and after I crumple it up, it's still cellulose. Now, what if I light it on fire? That's chemical because it's no longer cellulose. The cellulose is being converted into carbon dioxide and water when it combines with oxygen in a combustion reaction. So that's a chemical change where our reactant substances are different than our product substances. Whereas when we just freeze water, it's water in the liquid form to begin with, but then it's water H2O in the solid form when we're done, but it's still just H2O either way. Uh, another good example of a chemical change is like when a nail rusts. So a nail being made of iron, but combines with oxygen to form iron oxide, that is a chemical change. We're turning it into different chemical substances. Cool. So definitely two of the most common examples of those chemical changes you should know. One physical change you should realize, if I take NaCl and I put that NaCl in water, it dissolves. But is it chemical or physical? It would be physical because it's still the NaCl, they're still in the water. The Good. We technically consider it still NaCl, and if we evaporate off the water, the sodium chloride is still there. So definitely a physical change when you dissolve salt in water. Awesome. Getting towards the end of our vocab here, intensive versus extensive property. Cool. So it all depends on whether or not the size of your sample matters. So for an intensive property, the size of your sample is irrelevant. This property of a substance does not depend on the sample size. Whereas for extensive, it totally depends on the sample size. So if we look here, if I have a cup full of water and a swimming pool full of water, Will they have the same mass? No. Which one will have a bigger mass? Swimming pool. So here, mass is an extensive property. How large a sample size you have totally depends. Now, the glass full of water and the swimming pool full of water, what will be the melting point or the freezing point of the glass of water? Uh, point 30. 32 Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius. So and that's melting or freezing, just depending on which way you're going. So now for the entire swimming pool full of water, what would be the melting or freezing point? Uh, Same. And so notice it doesn't matter on your sample size. So something like your melting point or your boiling point or something of that sort, those are intensive properties. How big or small your sample doesn't change that property of a substance. So notice another thing, your, your glass of water, your swimming pool full of water, which one has a bigger volume? Mm -hmm. So glass of water, swimming pool full of water, which one has a bigger volume? Swimming pool. So volume is also an extensive property, which is where things get tricky here because density is an intensive property. So the density of water around room temperature is one gram per milliliter. Whether you have an entire swimming pool full of water or a little glass of water, the density is about one gram per milliliter. So notice mass and volume separately are extensive, but when you divide mass over volume, you get an intensive property. Cool. Last piece of vocab here, precision versus accuracy. In our everyday vernacular, we kind of just treat these things as exactly the same thing, but they are not. What's the difference? Awesome. So I like to think of it as repeatability of a measurement or something like that. Or in the case of, say, a dartboard, there might be your bullseye, and whether you hit your bullseye a bunch of times, or whether, you know, you got a second archer who comes up and doesn't hit the bullseye a bunch of times. Both of these archers, the red archer and the blue archer here, they are both very precise. 
they're able to hit the same point over and over and over again. That's precision. Whether you're hitting the point you're aiming for is besides the point. But that's what accuracy is all about. So in this case, which archer is actually being accurate and precise? Yeah. So this guy here is both accurate and precise, the red one. But the blue one, he's precise, but he's not accurate. As long as it, well, I mean, if he's aiming for that point on the target, well, OK then. But if he was aiming for the bullseye, he's precise, but not accurate. Could you be accurate, but not precise? Yeah. How so? Yeah, it's kind of hard to envision on, on this, but you know, if you like hit around the edges, which averages out to the middle or something like that. And so normally in this context, we probably wouldn't talk about it. But if you're measuring, you're taking a bunch of measurements. So let's say you take a bunch of measurements of the same thing. And let's say you never actually get all that close to the true value, but when you average out all the measurements, the average comes out close to the true value. That would be an example where you're accurate, but you're not very precise. Make sense? Cool. Um, you should definitely know the difference between precision and accuracy.